So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome for uh, today's uh, webinar. My name is Karen Shah. I'm the Director of Development here at the Israel Religious Action Center, a, the legal and advocacy arm of the reform movement in Israel. We, before we start, we wanted to thank our partners uh, for today's presentation, uh, uh, out Alta with uh, Rabbi Leah Mulstein and Rabbi Josh Weinberg Alsenu with Dekel Chumash and uh, Temple uh, Emmanuel in, in New York. We have uh, Rabbi Josh Davidson uh, moderating today's webinar, uh, which will focus on something that we've never, we've didn't see in Israel for a very, very long time. It's the fourth election in two years. Talk about deja vu. Uh, before we start, I wanted to uh, do some house uh, housekeeping items. I lost you. I don't know why. Um, housekeeping. How many items? Um, with everyone, uh, as with our former webinars, the presentation will be recorded and we'll send it to everyone. We hope that we will have captions when we send it uh, and subtitles for your convenience. And uh, if you have questions during the webinars, the webinar, please don't wait uh, for uh, when Rabbi J uh, Davidson asks you for questions, send them ahead on the chat box uh, and we will um, refer to it uh, um, when we have time for Q&A. And, and so without further ado, I am now going to mute myself and uh, leave the floor to you, Rabbi Davidson. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Dear friends, welcome to this important briefing. As Israel approaches its fourth round of elections in two years, one month from today. I'm Rabbi Joshua Davidson of Temple Emmanuel in New York City. And I want to thank our partners today, Artsa, Artsenu, and of course, the Israel Religious Action Center, whose leaders are our featured speakers. Many of you know them, but for those who don't, I'll introduce them now. Anat Hoffman, Iraq's executive director since 2002, was born and raised in Jerusalem. Israel's swimming champion as a teen, Anat is accustomed to braving the currents and diving into the deep end. Her position at Iraq places her at the forefront of the effort to advance religious pluralism in the state of Israel and the fight against gender segregation in the public domain. She led Women of the Wall for over three decades in the struggle towards gender equality at the Kotel, the holiest site of the Jewish faith. She also served on Jerusalem's city council for 14 years, heading the opposition. In that role, she pushed relentlessly for equality and tolerance in a city run by a powerful Orthodox bloc. Not was selected as person of the year by Haaretz in 2013 and chosen as one of the 50 most influential Jews by the Jerusalem Post in 2014. In 2018, Globes named her as one of Israel's top activists. Rabbi Noah Satat is the director of the Israel Religious Action Center, leading the staff of the organization and developing and implementing social change strategies in the fields of separation of religion and state, women's rights, and the struggle against racism. Prior to her work at Iraq, Noah was the executive director of the Jerusalem Open House, the LGBT Community Center in Jerusalem. Noah was also the executive director of MEET, an NGO that uses technology to create a common language between Israeli and Palestinian young leaders. Before her public service, Noah worked as a leader in the Israeli software industry. She was ordained as rabbi by the Hebrew Union College in 2014. So with their credentials established, let's begin. I'll be asking the first series of questions, but then we will open it up for some of yours too, and you can send them in as some of you are via the chat function. Noah, perhaps it would be helpful to set the table by asking you to say just a few words about our reform movement's stake in the policies of the Israeli government. Absolutely. So the reform movement in, um, in Israel as, as it is around the world is advocating for our values, our holy values to become reality in the political, different political spheres 
that we're living in. Um, in Israel, that means that we are trying to advocate for the values that were for the values of justice and equality. There's an echo. Am I the only one hearing an echo? I hear it. I hear it too. Leo, can you help us with the echo? Okay, let's try again. Oh, there we go. Hi. Uh, so, um, so in terms of the, um, we're trying to advocate for the values of justice and equality around the world. In Israel, advocating for those these values are is even more significant because Judaism and religion play such a big role in uh, the political life of the country, and so we are mandated to speak up. Uh, almost constantly as we see Judaism uh, used, sometimes abused, sometimes manipulated to justify um, acts of injustice and discrimination. Um, the Iraq as a social justice arm of the movement advocates for five uh, strategic goals, uh, which include um, equality for our progressive movements, the conservative movement and the reform movement in Israel the uh, dismantling of the orthodox monopoly on uh, public life in Israel. Uh, we are struggling against the phenomena of gender segregation in the public sphere. Uh, we are fighting to protect uh, Israel's democracy and we are um, trying to, to raise our voice and make a change in the, term in the field of uh, racism and racist incitement in Israel. So these are the five major issues that we're advocating for and we're working both in the court system uh, and media and social media, and also obviously in the Knesset, which is a hugely important arena uh, for all of these causes. Okay, so let's get to the matter at hand. What is going on? As bewildering as American politics have become, Israel's leave most of us scratching our heads. How can there possibly be four rounds of elections in only two years? Yes, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, it's not like we're not baffled um, as well. Uh, Israel really is in a deadlock politically. Um, since, uh, since the elections that were held in April uh, 2019, we haven't really been able to have a stable Knesset, even though we did have one government in those two years, it was barely functional for even uh, even short periods of time. Um, and what happens uh, basically is that the Israeli political system works in, a, in the matter of forming a coalition. So no one party rules, there are, there's a multiplicity of, of parties and, uh, and that will go into them to the different players in a minute. Um, and th no, the, there are two major blocks in Israeli politics right now, uh, all focusing on the issue of um, the continued administration of uh, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, as our Prime Minister. He's been our Prime Minister for 12 years and is now facing uh, three criminal charges. His trial has already begun and he is still Prime Minister. Um, and there's a very big segment of the Israeli population, uh, some may say a majority, that uh, will not stand for it and wants to see a different prime minister. And there is a, a very, very large segment of the Israeli population uh, that um, wants him to continue to be the prime minister uh, and sees the allegations against him as, um, as irrelevant or unimportant. Uh, and these two blocks are almost the same size and there's not been uh, a clear decision between them or there's not been an ability of either one of them to really form a co coalition. And that's why we're going to elections again and again and again, and maybe even again. I mean, we, we already know the date of the fifth elections if this doesn't work out uh, until there's gonna be a decision between those two blocks. Uh, um, either Netanyahu uh, achieves um, a complete victory, allowing him to form a, a stable government, or the other side achieves a victory that allows them to um, form a stable government. But it's very confusing. It's really destabilizing. Um, 
you know, Knesset members are depressed because there is the, there is no parliamentary action for almost two years. Uh, usually at IRAC, we do a lot of work trying to block uh, different types of legislation. We have not had to do that because there was almost no, no legislation in the past couple of years. But also there's been no progress, no stability, uh, no responsible government in this very difficult time, um, which makes us all want there to be finality to the decision, if even, uh, even for that. So following the key figures and parties isn't so easy from afar. Can you tell us um, who the main players are, old and new, and help us also understand the shifting party dynamics? Hey, this is going to be my job. Um, so if we could show, uh, maybe the photos would help you. I'll show you some of the players. These are hard Hebrew names, but I'll try to, just to give you a sense. Altogether, you should know that 39 parties have listed themselves as uh, running on this uh, election that will happen on the 23rd of uh, March for the 24th Knesset. So 39 parties, the threshold is 3.25 of the uh, percent of the kosher votes, which makes it around 145,000 votes. So many of these parties will not even cross the threshold. I will talk to you about only <laughs> 11 of the parties that clearly will cross the threshold. And I'll start with Nitzan Horowitz. You maybe uh, you see him on the very, oh, there's a, thank you so much. Okay, so he, this is Nitzan Horowitz. He's 57, he's from Lechovot, he's a, uh, a lawyer. He also does documentary movies. He's the head of the peace and civil rights movement, Meretz and he is on the cusp of passing the threshold. Uh, he is the uh, left, the Zionist left of Israel. Next, I will talk about Avigdor Lieberman. Mr. Lieberman, you see him over here. He's the head of Israel, Israel Beitenu. Israel is our home. Uh, he made Aliyah from, uh, he is 63 years old. He made Aliyah from, the, from, the, uh, from Russia. He lives in Nokdim, which is a settlement in the West Bank. In the past, he was our Minister of Foreign Affairs and our Minister of uh, Security. And he is the father figure of a strong man that Russians, about half of his voters are Russian, uh, that want to look, want to find a politician that, that is strong, uh, particularly against the Arabs, against um, anything that will, you know what a strong man is, a Putin kind. Our, our Putin is a Lieberman, by the way, he gets along very well with Mr. Putin. He is a secularist, I would say even a provocative secular person, and he is he belongs to the camp that will not sit with Netanyahu. Next, I want to talk about Yair Lapid. Yair Lapid is the, oops, here he is, he's the head of, there is a future, Yesh Atid. Uh, his party is now uh, in the polls, 17 to 18 seats. This is a very talented uh, guy. He's 57 years old, lives in Tel Aviv. He wrote uh, 12 books. Uh, many of them are, a, a, I think he was in the bestseller list 100 times. He's the father of an autistic child. He's very interested in autism and in, uh, this, in the special needs. Uh, he was the big surprise of the 2013 elections with half a million Israelis voting for Yesh Atid. He's a liberal centrist and he will not sit with Netanyahu uh, no matter what. Next, I want to talk about Merav Michaeli, the only woman in this whole group. She's the head of the party and the head of labor. Labor, that old party that actually uh, started the, Israel, uh, this, the Jewish state. Uh, now she is the head of the party. She's 51, a very staunch feminist. She, in fact, invented a language that is, uh, a, the, you know, Hebrew has a gender for everything. Your salt shaker has a gender. The tablecloth has a gender. So she obliterates all that. She invented her own Hebrew. She was ridiculed in the beginning, and now people are copying her and... Uh, uh, she is not, she's against marriage. If you want to see her TED talk, 
It's a very strong statement against marriage, but she lives in an apartment above one of Israel's famous uh, TV hosts, and they are, they've been a couple, the power couple of Israel for a long time. And uh, I will also tell you that number four on her list is the first reform rabbi ever to be in a realistic seat to the Knesset. So we'll talk about labor a little more. And now to Benjamin Netanyahu, a, my esteemed colleague uh, mentioned that he's been now 12 years running our prime minister. But let me remind all of us that uh, between 96 and 99, he was also prime minister for three years. So if you add the 12 years now and the three years then, 15 years prime minister of Israel, this is more than Ben-Gurion, who was 14 years our prime minister. He is um, charged with the three counts of bribery, fraud and breach of trust. And if he is convicted, ladies and gentlemen, he will face 19 years in prison. So much of this election has to do with him avoiding the uh, natural consequences of, the, of this uh, important trial. I'm moving now to Ayman Ode. Ayman Ode at the very bottom uh, here. Ayman Ode is an Arab born in Haifa. Uh, he is one of my um, favorite members of Knesset. He heads the joint list, the uh, joint Arab list. Uh, about he, he, the polls are showing that he may get nine seats in this next Knesset. He is a lawyer as well. He speaks Romanian, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. He is the greatest admirer of Martin Luther King. He can quote King anytime, English, Hebrew, Arabic. Uh, I see him as a, a messenger of a new kind of Arab that actually we can build a country with, uh, with an Arab like him. And uh, he's a, I'm so proud of this Israeli citizen. You should know that Ayman Ode is a, uh, one, a, a person that you would like to meet. He's a communist, he wrote a book, he's a father of three and still lives in Haifa. Next, I wanna tell you about Bezalel Smotrich. You see him right next to Ayman. He's the head of the uh, Zionist party and this is a uh, very uh, dangerous party. They are uh, the National Unity Party. He studied law, he's 41. He lives in a, in a settlement, Gudumim. Uh, he started a lobby again for the annexation of the West Bank into Israel. He did a beast parade, making donkeys walk in, the, uh, in Jerusalem street, holding, wearing signs of the gay parade, the beasts parade as a, as a criticism for very pr provocative criticism of the gay parade in Jerusalem. Uh, he lobbies for encouragement of Jewish birthing. And he said that he would not want his wife to give birth in the same room as an Arab woman. He thinks there should be segregation between babies and women who give birth. He's now made a coalition together with two very extremist other, two other parties that are very extremist. Uh, and sadly, he is uh, not on the cusp, but actually is a solid uh, crossing the threshold and he will be a party uh, coming up. Next is uh, Itamar Ben Gvir. You see him right next to Smotrich. They are together. Itamar Ben Gvir has been a focus of Iraq's work for a long time, maybe because he had 53 indictments so far and has been charged endless times and uh, convicted with seven criminal charges. He is, um, he is the student of Mayor Kahana, thank you very much, an import from America. He's a right wing radical. Uh, in the last election, he ran on his own and received 83,000 votes. So he did not cross the threshold. And remind, remind you, the threshold is 145,000. He's quite far from it, but Mr. Netanyahu has made great efforts to have Ben Gvir join Mr. Smotrich, and this party apparently will pass the threshold. Moving right along, I want to talk about Benny Gantz, the tragic, uh, where is he? 
Here he is, Benny Gantz. He was our 20th chief of staff, very tall, very a gentle, a very nice gentleman, but really unfit for Israeli politics. Uh, and he was able to get into the, the 23rd Knesset with 33 seats. And he's now barely crossing the threshold, barely having four seats. He is a, uh, he was born in a farm, really a guy that's way too nice for the turbulence of the Israeli politics. Uh, next, I want to talk about uh, Moshe Gafni. Moshe Gafni here has been a member of Knesset for uh, almost 30 years. He's 69. In the last six Knessets, he was head of the finance committee, pouring millions towards the ultra-Orthodox sector. He is really, it's now almost a saying in Hebrew, to do a Gafni is to just hop the, hop the money. Uh, he just mentioned that if the reform rabbi, Gilad Kariv, I'll next talk about him, will enter the Knesset, we will not sit in any committee that he speaks. When he speaks, we'll walk out of the room. We will not count him as, uh, as a Jew for a minion. We will not pray with him. And uh, bringing him in is like bringing an idol into the sanctuary. And now let's talk about Gilad Kariv the head of the Israel Movement for Progressive Judaism, our colleague and our friend. Um, I'd have you know that Gilad Kariv uh, was born in uh, the 30th of November, 1973. That night might not mean much to you, but it is a very meaningful date. This is the day Ben-Gurion passed away. They were both, Ben-Gurion died in Ramat Gan on the 30th of November, 73, and that is the same town, Ramat Gan, where Gilad resides today. He's a vegetarian, a lawyer, a rabbi, our leader, a vegetarian, and he already announced that every new month he will use his immunity, take a Torah scroll, and walk into the women's section, giving the women of the wall a chance to read Torah, which is such a wonderful thing. Last, I want to uh, mention, um, no, there are two last, Arya Deri. Arya Deri up there from Shas. He's 62 years old. He was uh, charged and convicted with three counts of, guess what? Bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. He sat in jail for three years and still was reelected to be our Minister of Interior. He's been our Minister of Interior for dozens of years. And uh, to the extent that we are struggling to open Judaism and open Israel to various forms of Judaism, he's been the worst obstacle. And finally, Naftali Bennett. Uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, right here, head of the Yamina party, is quite an extraordinary guy. 48 years old. He was born in Haifa to American parents from Temple Emmanuel of San Francisco. They made Aliyah, they lived in Haifa. Uh, they made Aliyah in 67, so all three boys were born in, uh, in Israel. But in 73, uh, having enough of the Israelis, they went back to America. And uh, their young son became a entrepreneur, uh, built a uh, high-tech company that was sold uh, the, uh, I don't know how to say the name of that company, but it was sold to millions of dollars to RCA. Then he worked for RCA. He had another exit to millions of dollars. He's a very accomplished right wing uh, leader. And uh, he was our minister of defense at one point. He was our minister for uh, minister of education at another point. Uh, there are predictions that he will get something between 11 to 12 seats in the coming Knesset and he I think will be the kingmaker in Israel. If he decides to sit with Netanyahu, then we will have another term with Netanyahu. And if Bennett says no, then Mr. Gidon Saar would be uh, likely to be our uh, prime minister. Gidon Saar is head of a new party called New Hope. Uh, he used to be our minister of education and our minister of interior. He's 54 years old. And in 2014, he did a radical uh, step. He left politics 
fell in love with a TV uh, anchor woman, Gila Evan, and devoted four years to playing with his child, with his two new children from with her. Um, that's quite extraordinary. And then with a vengeance in 2018, he came back into politics saying that Likud can be clean. One of the important things about Gidon Sao that he was not charged ever with any, uh, any uh, corruption, which is saying something. Listen, we, we saw that some of these ministers sat in jail. So Gidon Saar may be the next uh, Prime Minister of Israel. It all depends on Mr. Bennett. Take it from here, Noah. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna stop the share. I know this; these were a lot of names, um, uh, but uh, each one of them can be um, uh, critical uh, for our future. Um, so this is, um, 2021 has been the, the, the thir third year in a row in which we made a work plan saying there's going to be elections and we don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, and when you have that situation, you build work plans for different scenarios. And we have completely failed in anticipating the scenarios in the past. So I'm going to give you our uh, anticipation for the future. Bear in mind that we were not able to be very successful in anticipating in the past. Um, but we are currently looking at um, three potential scenarios and there, there are many spin-offs of each one of them. Um, since we have to, to end with an achemta, I'm gonna start with the worst and I'm gonna uh, go to the best and, and bear with me, the worst is very bad, the best is very good. Um, the, the most dangerous scenario that we can think of uh, is, um, is a right-wing, um, uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox coalition led by Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, this will both be a very difficult coalition for us to promote any type of religious freedom in. I mean, that's not gonna, they're gonna vehemently oppose any achievement and try to roll back some of our past achievements. Um, and even I would say more importantly, it's gonna be a coalition um, that threatens the very essence of uh, Israel's democracy. Um, just uh, zooming out, Israel has no constitution. And in Israel, the separation between the legislative and the executive branches is very, very um, um, minimal uh, because the prime minister controls the government, which controls the, the parliament, the Knesset. Um, and so the main two checks and balances on the power of government that we have are the judicial arm and the press. Um, and Netanyahu has, since he wants to avoid trial, has made very, very clear statements about his uh, wish to undermine the independence of the judicial arm in Israel, and also has made very clear uh, attempts to limit the freedom of the press. So if th in this scenario, we will have to be in a very, um, You'll have to be very geared up towards a defensive mode, trying to partnering with many different players to protect uh, Israel's democracy. Um, the um, moving to more optimistic scenarios, um, there could be a government led by without Netanyahu, led by. Um, other right-wing figures like uh, um, Gidon Sal that uh, Anat mentioned, or Naftali Bennett, or some combination of, the, of those with or without the ultra-Orthodox. Um, that kind of uh, government will be very challenging for us on some of our issues, um, including racism, but it could be a, a government where we can promote policy, policies in terms of um, separation of religion and state, specifically if there's no, not much power to the ultra-Orthodox parties. Uh, we have had very, uh, we have had a very long dialogue with uh, Gidon Sa. We've known him for many, many years. Um, and we can be optimistic that we will have a better working relationship with him than we've had with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, so this is a different scenario that we're working, that we're looking at. Um, more optimistic scenarios 
are of a government uh, that would be without the ultra-Orthodox, uh, which will allow us to, to advance multiple issues on religion and state. Um, we know that no government has completed a term since 1981. All of the Israeli governments have fallen without completing a term. So some of our governments are very short-lived. And if we have a good government, we have to be very, very strategic, effective, and quick in getting all the, the achievements that we can. And that's what we're focusing on right now, that if there's a window of opportunity, we are going to get right into that window and do everything that we can in a very short uh, amount of time uh, that we have. Or, and if it's a longer time, then we'll do more, but we wanna be, uh, we wanna be very ready. Um, there's also a possibility of, um, of a centrist government which also provides many opportunities for us in many of the issues that we're trying to promote. Uh, and we are also gearing up for that. So I'm, I'm guessing you're as, uh, you are as confused as we are in terms of what's going on, uh, but maybe you know you have a better understanding of the different challenges and opportunities. And I'm happy to, we're both happy to elaborate on how we take it from there in terms of, uh, what we do with uh, with these opportunities. Noah, your, your last comment almost seems to suggest that you don't expect the outcome of this election to be significantly different in terms of the government's duration as those of the past. It, is that true? Do you expect that we're going to find ourselves facing a fifth election? That's That's definitely a possibility. That is definitely a possibility. Uh, there are things that shifted, um, you know, in terms of um, Israeli voters will be voting, um, I think, a lot of based on COVID response, uh, and there are mixed signals here and there. It's very polling has been has been really wrong in the past in Israel, so and that's given the the information of current polls. Uh, four weeks and four weeks ahead of time, things could really shift. And even then, the last polls have been notoriously unreliable. Uh, but yes, absolutely. And if there is going to be um, a, a fifth election, it's going to be uh, uh, probably September second, um, because that's the time it takes for a government. Different people try to establish a government, and then they have ninety days. September second is the date we're gearing up for. Um, and, and, and that is definitely, I, I wanna share a story about uh, Victor Lieberman, who's the head of the um, Israel Beitenu uh, party. He's a very tough guy. He has no mimics. He's, he always speaks in the same tone and with the same facial expression. So we came to see him before the third elections and um, Rag, Rabbi Rick Jacobs asked him, so how many elections are we gonna have so he looks right at Rick and he says, as long as, it, as long as it takes for you to vote the right way, we're gonna continue having elections. So <laughs> I guess we may have to, to be voting more again and again and again until we get, until we get it right. Uh, but all joking aside, the fact that there's no Knesset is very troubling in, in a democratic system that we have had such an absent for, have had such an important force absent for so long. <clears throat> Anat, did you want to jump in on that? I think Noah's on a roll. I'm sitting here and I'm saying to myself, you, you guys are ex really exposed to a treat because I'm, if you watch Israeli TV and you see some of the experts trying to explain what's going on, basically in a nutshell, in this half hour, you got a good sense of what what are the problems, and what's at stake. So I'm go Noah, you're on a roll. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to turn to the, the questions that we've uh, begun to receive, and I'll invite those of you who are watching to send them in. Um, but um, Jeffrey Albesser, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, right. Uh, asks a little bit about the. Um, the, the weakening of the left and the center left in Israel. Um, can you say a word about that trend over this last period of time? So the left really has as a, 
first of all, it's a question of what we're talking about, because if you pull Israelis and ask, um, are you in favor of um, a two-state solution? Or are you in favor of uh, uh, separation of uh, religion and state? Or are you in favor of, um, of uh, LGBT rights? People would say yes. The majority would say yes, which were classic left-wing um, uh, principles that, uh, that the left advocated for. And people support them and they're also supported by different parties that are centrist. Um, but I think that the most uh, uh, jarring poll that I saw was the question, do you support equality? 73% of the Israeli population says yes, of course. So 73% of the Israeli Jewish population. But if the question is, do you support equality for Arab citizens? It's 48%. Uh, and the ongoing co conflict and the ongoing incitement against Arabs, um, Arab citizens, specifically uh, from, uh, from the prime minister, but also from other um, right-wing leaders, I think is, has gotten us to a place where left is identified with, uh, with that principle and that principle is being rejected. Um, I think that populist leaders are gaining, have gained strength around the world before COVID. Um, and I think that some of them are facing very deep uh, um, divisions and, and conflicts right now. And I'm, I'm very interested and curious and also fearful to see how that plays along in Israel in terms of the next uh, elections campaign. Um, but I think the left has faced a very, very brutal attack. Um, and we are in search of a leader that will uh, reclaim the left and, and, uh, and bring it back to power. And, and we will, and that still remains to be seen. So it is about a, a charismatic leader? Um, I think that in some sense, it's about a charismatic leader. Um, I think that the, the uh, right and center right uh, have multi a multiplicity of charismatic leaders. Uh, the left has uh, Ayman Uda, who's, who's a very charismatic leader, but he is a leader of, um, of the Arab Palestinian population in Israel. He doesn't see himself as a generally Israeli leader. That's not what he's aiming to be right now. Um, and we don't have a leadership, but also it's about just the, um, the idea of security, the idea, and you, you saw how many men were on this list and how few women. It's about that uh, idea of a powerful leader um, uh, uh, and resisting the um, globalist trends and, and, and returning to, to populist and, and anti-democratic trends that is happening around the world and it's also happening in Israel. And even, I, I just wanna say that around the world, um, populist leaders always invent an enemy uh, so that they can fight, um, you know, if it's the, uh, if it's the drug uh, uh, lords in the Philippines or if it's the Mexicans in, uh, uh, in the US, in Israel, there is a real enemy which makes it much easier for, for populist leaders to rise. We've seen in the United States that charges of corruption don't necessarily undermine a political candidate. Um, Tom Abelson asks about the impact of the trial um, on Netanyahu and these elections. And I would also add as a counterpoint, um, what's the impact of Israel's response to the coronavirus on the prime minister in this election. So, um, so, the, so the trial has begun uh, after many, many delays. Uh, the evidence um, segment of the trial is scheduled to begin any day and that will require three hearings a week. Um, our staff was in the, the uh, court on the opening day of the trial, it's a very, different environment when, you know, the prime minister comes to trial. Um, and uh, I think it's divided in the same way that corruption charges were dividing in the US. 
Some people are appalled and they cannot believe that this is happening, that we actually have a prime minister who's sitting in court while he is still prime minister. Um, and others are seeing it as a um, witch hunt against the prime minister who is so important, who's currently almost always working for our best interests. And, you know, so he got some cigars from this guy and maybe he bought some submarines for some that we didn't need, but, you know, it's all negligible uh, in terms of his contribution to our country. So it's really, really div the divisive between the different types of, the, of uh, voters in terms of how significant that is. Um, the legal experts have always said that Netanyahu, that legally it's going to be awful for Netanyahu to um, face trial as, as prime minister. That from that perspective, he would want to resign first. Um, but, but that doesn't seem to be um, really uh, um, becoming reality, but it could, if as the trial progresses, progresses, maybe that will become more true that it will become more urgent for him to, uh, to resign. Um, the trial could take a very long time. The trial could uh, take uh, a couple of years uh, even though the judges have said that they want to have a, a very rapid trial, it could take two years to get a conviction, and then he can appeal to the Supreme Court, which could take another year or two. So until he has a final verdict, that's a long way, ways away. Uh, that's why we're not, I saw a question about why we're not waiting for the end of the trial. The end of the trial is nowhere near. I, I just want to say that we have a different uh, system. So and I know that in the U.S., the, the process is, is impeachment through the um, through the House, the uh, Senate, and the Congress. Here, Netanyahu is facing a trial like any other person. He goes to court. He's facing. He is now facing charges in the district court. If he's convicted, he can uh, appeal to the Supreme Court. And it's it's not done politically. It's only done uh, in the legal system. And it he has all the rights of any other convict to appeal. To, some, to, to request the evidence, to summon witnesses. He has all those rights that every other citizen has. And how about the impact of COVID and the response? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So, so again, it's, it, de it depends on who you're comparing Israel with, right? So in, on one sense, Israel is uh, um, uh, fantastic in terms of uh, the rates of vaccines. Uh, tomorrow we're having our first staff meeting after um, almost a year because all of our staff is vaccinated and all of our families are vaccinated. So we can come back to interacting with, uh, with each other. And this is true for uh, many, many Israelis that we have gotten the vaccine. Uh, and because we have a um, universal healthcare system that has all of us on file and can very effectively vaccinate all of us, um, uh, we have that. Um, but again, it's a question of who you're comparing us to. If you're comparing Israel to the US, we're doing great. If you're, but Israel can also be compared to uh, places like Australia because we don't have open borders with anybody. Uh, and if we're comparing ourselves to that, then the death rates and the infection rates in Israel are much higher than any of those isolated states. Um, so again, there's a question of who you, who you are and who you're looking at in terms of uh, comparisons. I'd like to just add about the, to, to the Tom Abelson's uh, question that the nature of truth is something you and us are wrestling with. Look, Netanyahu is not the first prime minister to face charges before him, Eud Olmert, faced charges and went to jail. Olmert throughout said, just like Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated with three hollow points bullets in the back, I was assassinated by this witch hunt that uh, they wanted to stop me from doing bold steps that will bring peace. I'm a victim. Now, Olmert is different from Netanyahu with one thing. Olmert doesn't own a newspaper. He doesn't have the late Sheldon Edelson, as Netanyahu does, that provides him with a paper that is given out to, for free every day to 
Israelis and has become the most popular paper in Israel. So the reality Israelis consume is the reality that Netanyahu wants them to consume. And this, is, this should be familiar to the Ameri to North American audiences. It's a, uh, Netanyahu says these things don't exist. That's what he says. There wasn't anything and there will be nothing from this whole trial. And this paper drums it in again and again and again. So many Israelis think that, but I, we know the Ministry of Justice, we know the professionals that work there, and we know that these charges are based on evidence. So the trial is a serious issue. <laughs> And reality is something we're wrestling with. Where do we, where do we, can we purchase reality that is, that resembles reality? Let's get back to stalemate in the government for a moment. Um, Fifi Heller Kayim asks, did I understand correctly that the Knesset has not operated since the last election? So first of all, the, la the Knesset has not operated since the 2019 elections, not the 2020, the last elections were in, uh, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in March of 2020, since the, since the uh, elections of, uh, so there were elections in April, 2019 and the Knesset was disassembled three months before that. So since the beginning of 2019, we haven't had a functional Knesset, which means that members are elected but there, are, there have been very, very few votes in the plenum and there have been very, very few committee meetings and hearings. Um, when, when a government, the process is, uh, there are 90 days of um, the Knesset being disassembled before the elections. And then after the elections, there are, there's a process of assembling a government which can take up to, uh, up to 105 days uh, and then, and during that time, members are sworn in, but there are no votes and no hearings. And then there are 90 days until you get to the next elections. So that's what we've had three times through the, uh, over the course of 2019 uh, until uh, uh, July of 2020. And then in July of 2020, we did have a government, um, but it, first of all, there was the coronavirus. So the, the Knesset operated uh, under very strict uh, uh, limitations. And they basically only held emergency hearings and committee meetings. And that was also almost all, all uh, 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 almost exclusively virtual. And then the Knesset got disassembled in uh, December again. So we've had a very few, uh, a very, very short window of operation of the Knesset. And even that was not full operation. And the political crisis, the imminent end of the government was always present. So there were no long-term processes um, going in the Knesset since the beginning of 2019. Iraq is one of the most um, significant um, political advocacy organizations in, in the country. Um, you and not are a, a figure of extraordinary influence. I'm not sure how much influence you have on the right the more conservative uh, members of Knesset or, or their parties, but you have some influence um, on the left. If you were to say to uh, parties on the left or figures on the left, and this is a question that was really uh, posed to us, um, you know, don't run separately, run together. Um, are there parties that you might suggest should have uh, combined their efforts like merits and labor or others? Are there alliances that should have been made in order to cut through uh, some of this log jam. You're asking me? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, these alliances will, will yield more votes. It's not uh, at all clear that uh, running, that being together, we will get uh, more votes than separately. The left has uh, received a tremendous blow, and I think Noah explained very well how we were the imagined enemy of the right. We were bashed for 12 years by the prime minister, and the result is that to be a leftist 
is uh, something sometimes you need to apologize for and you need to uh, explain, I'm a, I'm a liberal and yet I am a patriot. I am a leftist, but I do love Israel. Uh, there are many ways to love Israel as there are many ways to be Jewish. And uh, with the, 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 I don't think that the coalitions in the left will yield more, more votes. So, so, so the question here is always, uh, the fear is for a party to run and not meet the threshold, which means if a leftist party runs and gets 125,000 votes and not 130,000 votes, then all of those votes are cast aside. Um, so that's the fear, and that's why uh, leftist parties have merged in the previous elections. Uh, this time they took a gamble saying, we will run separately with distinct uh, platforms that will bring us more voters and we will, each one of us, pass separately. Uh, that's a gamble. Uh, we will have to see how that works out. Uh, currently, some of them are tittering on, um, over the edge. Uh, the Blue and White Party, the party headed by Gantz, uh, he is the chief of staff, and there was just a big petition of former military generals um, begging him to quit the race because he's not passing the threshold and he's wasting really, uh, votes. And this could come up with merits as well in, in the uh, in the near future. If they're not sure that they're going to get in, they're going to there's going to be a lot of pressure for them to pull out. But but if I may, I want to address myself to another question. Why should this be interested interesting? to you, Josh, to your congregants, to North American Jews, why, why this webinar? Why we want you to, be, uh, to know this uh, very complex story of Israel? And the answer is that we need you as partners. We share values. Israel is the most important historic development of our lifetime. And, we're, and Israel affects us and Israel reflects on us. We are eager feet and hands working to, to make this shared dream come true. And many times uh, North American Jews silence themselves and say, well, I don't pay taxes there. I don't send my children to the army there. It's a sovereign country. What right do I have to interfere? And the aim of this webinar is to say, please unmute yourself. We need to hear your voices. Israel may, is, is slowly with all these uh, elections, de our democracy is, de is becoming derailed. And you can keep this, uh, you can help the vision of the Zionist vision of a Jewish state uh, be more like what you'd like to see if you become engaged and involved. That's why we want you to read our newsletter and follow what we're doing and support us and be interested in the many ways that we offer you to influence what happens here. You know, the people on the other side have no such scruples. Mr. Edelson and others are influencing Israeli politics directly with money, with power, with influence. You should do it too. Well, maybe you could just say a little bit about um, the reform movement in Israel, Noah, your ordination from HUC, and Gilad, Karib's ordination, and the role that he is going to have in the Knesset. I mean, the Knesset, according to current uh, polls, suggests that it will have um, uh, six or seven uh, labor slots, and, and Gilad is number four. Yeah, absolutely. And Gilad, just, just to say more, Gilad ran in the Labour Party primaries and he got second place. He's number four on the list because uh, there is a um, system that uh, provides a, a preferential treatment uh, uh, to, to women candidates because there are so few women candidates. So he, um, after many years of, of politics, really brought the reform flag on the stage and it demonstrates what, once again the strength of our movement that in such a, an important party, people would vote for a reform rabbi with all of his values and all of his, um, um, with everything that he brings as uh, a major candidate in a major party. Uh, today, uh, the Labour Party, um, uh, they got new offices and uh, they posted a, a photo of uh, 
גלעד setting the, fixing the, the mezuzah with the uh, Meirav Michaeli, uh, which got a lot of comments. There were ultra-Orthodox um, uh, commentators saying, you know, in the past, labor used to bring ultra-Orthodox rabbis to do that, and now they're bringing reform rabbis to do that. Uh, and there's a great response from the Israeli, you know, Twitter followers saying, yeah, of course we need reform rabbis to do that and let the head of the party say the blessing, who is a woman, and not bring an ultra-Orthodox rabbi to say the blessing for her. Um, so, um, so, that's, uh, um, so that's real progress and it shows, uh, it has a tremendous promise uh, for us if uh, we have uh, a member of Knesset who represents us and our values. And certainly if we have a fantastic Knesset member like uh, Rabbi Gilad Kariv, who I'm sure will be a fantastic advocate for our um, for our causes uh, every day. I, I would also just want to say that um, that the work that you're doing, that all of us have the opportunity to support in all kinds of ways, um, doesn't just raise up great leaders like the two of you, like Gilad, like those on your staff. It also influences the attitudes of um, of the Israeli populace. Um, our movement, our beliefs have the power to uh, shape social values. And ultimately it is the people who elect their leaders. Um, we have the ability to influence the attitudes um, uh, of, of, those who, uh, of those who are part of our congregations and our communities. Um, before I wrap up, I want to give the two of you the last word. Is there anything else that you would want to add? Because we're coming up on 11 o'clock your time. Well, I'll just say something I've said many times. I really believe it. Israel is way too important to be left only to the Israelis. I turn to you, anyone who's listening right now and watching us. We need you. This is too important to be left only to the Jews living or the Arabs living in Israel together in the Jewish state. We need your influence and your input. No one can tell a North American Jew that he has no place or she has no place around the table where we discuss what are the Jewish values of the Jewish state. Are they racism and ethnocentrism and chauvinism or are there pluralism and equality and tolerance? You have a say, you've got to say it. And uh, we would be happy to link arms with you and make this shared dream come true. Very important. Um, so I would say that um, we're, we're living in times that are not simple, uh, but we, even though in some ways our power is diminished, our power is still here. And we have to be more strategic and more effective in asserting that power. And that's what we're doing and that's what we can do together. So I hope you're not discouraged by uh, what we have said, but informed and as energized and motivated as us to face whatever uh, outcomes uh, we see uh, on February, uh, on March uh, 23rd and work as hard as we can and as effectively as we can to build the Israel that we can all be proud of. Uh, and with that, I want to invite you to a webinar that we will hold on March 25th, um, in, which, in which we will analyze the uh, results, which may be as confusing as this webinar and maybe more simple, simple to understand. We don't know, but we will be here together and whatever the results are, and we will uh, continue our struggle um, to make a better Israel. And with our persistence and determination, we will get there. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. I, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and of course, our special thanks to two true heroes uh, of the Jewish world, Anat Hoffman and Rabbi Noah Satat. Take care, everyone, and be safe and be well. Thank you.